That's exactly how I feel with the subject I'm going to talk about right now. Quantum computing, baby. So a uh, little disclaimer here, family, folks, first timers. Uh, I am definitely not a scientist. I am not a physicist, definitely not a theoretical physicist. But this is an area that definitely interests me. I've talked about it before. There's no shortage of people talking about artificial intelligence. Yeah. And, uh, and maybe they mentioned quantum computing. Some mention it with disdain. You know, I wanted to try something today. I thought that if I speak today with a British accent, maybe I'll sound more intelligent. And if I put a little bit of classical music in the background, maybe it'll make me sound like I know what I'm talking about. Uh, it doesn't matter. Anyways, folks, welcome. Unscripted, because this one is truly unscripted. Uh, got an article from Ron. My brother, my brother, Ron. Uh, Ron. Ron and I, well, mostly Ron, shares articles with me all the time. And um, But quantum computing is something that Ron and I have been talking about. How'd you like that? Probably for a long time. Ever since we met, ever since we've been talking. Um, and uh, it's something that maybe some, like I said, are talking about. I don't know. Uh, I don't listen in really anybody anymore. So, uh, so be it. I've unplugged from the crazy prophetic matrix. If you don't know what I mean, go read the article that I just posted on prophetic sensationalism. You'll know what I mean. All right. Anyways, folks, quantum computing, that's a, it's a big deal. And it's a big word, too. And it has nothing to do with the Marvel comics or the Marvel movies or the multiverse, even though some I heard some dude on TED Talk saying trying to equate quantum computing and the multiverse and blah, blah, blah uh, kind of stuff. Right. Anyways, long story short. Hey, before I get going, uh, if you haven't gone to the Serpents and Doves Substack and subscribed, do so. Uh, also, share it. If you get a chance, share it with everybody. At the end of the day, we've got to get the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because look, family, seriously, we can talk Bible prophecy all day long. We can talk about news articles all day long. And that's just everybody is talking about news articles. News, 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 news. What else is new, right? We're getting fed a steady diet of news articles. But bottom line, folks, seriously, bottom line. This is about Jesus Christ, him crucified, resurrected. Because if, we, if it wasn't for that, we'd all be destitute. I think every one of us would agree with that, right? I hope so. And for those that don't, listen, um, we're all sinners. And we've heard this. You're sinners saved by grace. Duh, absolutely. The grace of Jesus Christ. Grace of our Lord and Savior. And the mercy, right? Getting what you don't deserve and not getting what you deserve. I include myself in that. The gospel, the gospel, the gospel. Some people frown on it, but at the end of the day, uh, that is our commandment. We are to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is it? El Evangelio, the good news. Right? You've heard the word evangelism. So bottom line, here it is. Before I get started, the gospel of Jesus Christ. A uh, song, Amazing Grace. I once was lost, but I'm found. I've been found. Praise God for that. Jesus Christ came to live among us. Hypostatic union. It's a big word. I don't like big words. I'm not a big word kind of guy. I don't talk in big words. I remember I took a, a little, little side note here for those of you guys know. I totally rabbit trail uh, in college. I think I've mentioned this before. It was critical thinking, reasoning, and writing. It was a fantastic class. Nobody was allowed to use big words or jargon. If you did, you get marked down or probably got an F. So it was great because you had to express yourself in layman, I mean, common man terms, which is the way I operate. So praise God. He left the throne of heaven. He came down to live among us, sinless, spotless, went to the cross, suffered, died on that cross for us. And on the third day, he rose, conquering death, defeated death. 
And praise God for that sacrifice because it, it doesn't cover our sins. The Bible says that our sins are no longer. We are made white as snow, right? White as scarlet. Our sins are as far as the east is from the west. They are not remembered for those of us in Christ. It is a free gift of salvation. I love quoting. I mean, a lot of us love to quote John 3.16, but what about the next verse? I've said this as well. John 3.17 is a beautiful verse too. 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever, that's everybody, believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. What a beautiful verse. Why? Because we're already condemned. We're, we're damned in our sins. It's a, it's a big word, right? Some people hear that and freak out, but it is. We are damned in our sins. And praise God, he didn't have to send his son to condemn us because we're already condemned. But that through him, we might be saved. Amen. Praise God for that. The Lord saved such an ugly wretch like myself. And I am still ever grateful for that. Some Somebody out there might be hitting rock bottom, might have hit rock bottom. You think that the Lord would never be able to save someone like you? Well, if you think that's the case, I would encourage you with Acts. I'm going through the book of Acts. And I love the book of Acts, especially where we look at chapter 8, and verse 3, where it says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison committing them to prison. And if we back up a little bit at the first martyr, which is Stephen, if you go back to chapter 7, verse 58, those that were stoning him, says they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their, clo their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And Saul was witnessing and he was consenting. We could see that in verse 1 of chapter 8, consenting to his death. Verse 2, at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. So they all scattered. And why, why am I reading this to you guys? Why am I bringing this up? Because it's beautiful to think that no matter where you've been, if God can save someone like Saul of Tarsus, he can save anybody. Verse chapter 9 of Acts, verse for, uh, the very first verse says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters for him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, those followers of Jesus Christ, whether men or women, he didn't care, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. I love it because on his way to get those letters is the... Uh, the road to Damascus conversion falls off the horse or whatever he was riding. And he says that he heard a, a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And this part is great. And he said, this is what Saul said. Who are you, Lord? It's one thing to know of God. And many people, they, they claim to know God. It's one thing to know of God. And it's a whole nother thing to know God personally. And that's the beauty of what's offered in a right relationship with Jesus Christ, folks, is to know God, the, the, the creator of the universe. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I want to just encourage you, when Ananias was sent to pray over Saul, it says this in chapter 9, verse 17. This is what Ananias said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Friend, do you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you want to know who Jesus Christ is? Jesus Christ can take your broken life, the pieces of your life, and he can put it back together, remake it in such a beautiful way. And that's the beauty of of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He has mercy and he grants us his grace 
for those that want it. We sinned against a holy God, and our punishment is hell, but praise God that in His mercy, in His grace, in His compassion, He sent His one and only Son to live among us, to die on the cross and raised from the dead so that we wouldn't have to spend eternity in punishment, but He made a way out. It's a free gift. You got to do is accept it. And I'm not telling you life's going to be easy. If anything, life might get even harder. Because you're on Satan's naughty list the day that you come to Jesus Christ. But friend, you will never regret that, especially for eternity. Like I've said before, eternity is guaranteed to everybody. We are all eternal beings. The difference is where are you going to spend eternity? What is going to be your final eternal address, heaven or hell? Simple. I don't like to beat around the bush. Why beat around the bush? What's more loving than to tell everybody the truth? And that's the bottom line. That's the truth. Okay, so let me get on with quantum computing. It is a behemoth of a subject, one that I'm interested in big time, even though I'm not a, I'm not a physicist, I'm not a scientist. I, I read some of these articles and it makes my head hurt. It just goes whew, right over my head because we're talking about quantum entanglement, singular, I mean, not singularity, quantum entanglement. We're talking about juxtaposition of, of atoms and qubits and superposition and yada, yada, yada. But the bottom line is this. Why did I want to come on today, of all times, and talk about quantum computing? Well, let me show you this article right here. There we go, and I'm down here. This is from Zero Hedge, and it says, The United States and the UK accelerate quantum computing programs after China breakthrough. And what is that breakthrough that China had? Well, let me go ahead and read this. Scientists and lawmakers in the United States, the UK, and European Union are ramping up efforts. Duh. Now that supposedly China has made this big groundbreaking breakthrough, they're ramping up efforts to advance quantum computing in the West after scientists in China observed what appears to be the world's first room temperature time crystal. Now, look, folks, I've read multiple articles and watched videos on trying to figure out the how time crystals work. And essentially, it, it just I came out more confused than before. But basically, think of a think of any kind of crystal, a diamond, right? Uh, even um, what do you call them? Uh, those those beautiful um, formations in the snow, right? That we make the little paper designs of called snowflakes. Those are crystals and they're perfectly symmetrical. So think, uh, see if I can, I'll try to explain it. Don't get your hopes up. But a time crystal, a uh, time crystal, a, a basic crystal, so for example, a snowflake exists in three dimensions, right? Height, width, depth. And if you, if you have a, a, a snowflake, right, like this, and I turn it 90 degrees, it's going to be perfectly symmetrical 90 degrees, or if I turn it again 90 degrees, or if I turn it again, it's always going to have the same symmetry. Crystals usually operate that way. Their structure is the same, no matter how you break it down. A time crystal doesn't work on the 3D. It works on based on time. Totally mind-blowing. I don't get it. Don't. Maybe some of you do. Go ahead, write comments, explain it to me. But this is huge in the sense of room temperature time crystals. Now, as far as I understand, the way that a quantum computer works is that a quantum computer must be, must operate, it, well, it does. Let me, let me see if I could back up a bit. I'm going to show you a picture of what a quantum computer looks like. All right. So basically, this is what a quantum computer looks like. They're, they don't look like your conventional 
they don't look like your conventional computer because they're not. It's a piece of hardware. And again, I can just scroll through some of these pictures and show you what a quantum computer. Some are bigger, some are smaller. As far as I know, I could be wrong. Last time I read IBM, no. There's a company out of California that now has the largest quantum computer because the way that a quantum computer operates is on qubits. That's the hardware. Here you see somebody working on a smaller quantum computer. And they're usually encased. Uh, these, what you're seeing here is a quantum computer out of the casing. Uh, but essentially, again, they work on what's called a qubit. So traditional computing, like the one I'm using here, like the one we use at home, it works on bits, zeros and ones, binary, right? And uh, those can only exist in one position. Think of an on or off switch. Uh, computers, traditional computers, classical computing, as it's called, works one step at a time. It can only do one process at a time. It is fed through the processor, and then it comes out on the other side. So command goes in, execution comes out, one at a time. And the speed of the processor determines how fast that information is processed, right? Your binary, your zeros and ones, how fast that command is processed. So the more processors you have, right? For example, there are now uh, eight core, 16 core, 32 core computers. The more processors, the more information can be processed simultaneously. But that could get pretty big. It could get pretty... Um, energy inefficient because the more you have in regards to to processors the more heat you create a processor creates a lot of heat as it processes information they can get really hot some are even liquid cooled and so you have computers that if they wouldn't have a heat sink and fans going everywhere, it would literally melt your computer down. So the more, the more uh, processing chips you have, the higher temperature, the more inefficient something becomes. And so what you have now is they, what they do is they, they, they have one processing chip but multiple cores in the chip that could process information so essentially think of four chips in one or eight chips in one basically the way a quantum computer works is that it works on qubits and the qubits operate based on the laws of physics this is subatomic so they work on the atomic level we're talking now about like atoms Okay, and this is where things get tricky because we're now dealing in the field of physics when classical computing works on binary, which is mathematical algorithms. Now, there are algorithms that do work in tandem with quantum computing. So essentially, think of think of uh two fields think of hardware okay your computer let me go ahead and my keyboard that is hardware and then there is software it is what makes the functionality it, it's what makes it function so the software i could hit h but if there's no software to translate the h to my computer the program whatever word processor it's not going to work so you have this marriage between hardware and software. That's what operates on your computer. If you didn't have a word processing system, you could type all you want, but nothing's going to happen on the computer. And so you have software developers that create these programs in order to, in, I mean, it really does help, right? it simplifies our task. Before, the hardware was, for those that remember Smith Coronas, IBMs, those big machines, they had the little ball, and you would, 
You had to put the tape in there, the correction tape. Well, the think of it this way. The big Smith Coronas, the IBMs, those were the hardware. We were the software, essentially. We were the ones typing and making, translating the, the keys, right? That was mechanical. You remember, you would hit a key, and then the little hammer would go up and strike the tape, and then you would get your letter. Well, they, with classical computing, everything is done through binary now, like I said. With quantum computing, though, it's, it's all changed. And the way that it works, the most basic way, without confusing, and like I said, I've read way too many articles, I've read way too many papers on quantum computing, and again, I'm just about as confused as I ever was because I've never studied physics. And so from my, my pea brain understanding is that the difference between classical and quantum computing, like I said, is that in classical computing, everything gets done one step at a time. Whereas in quantum computing, which is called superposition, you can have it all done all at the same time. Wherein one line of command has to go into a processor in quantum computing, and then you have the execution of that command come out on the other side, basically. In quantum computing, you can funnel a bunch of different commands all at once, and it all comes out on the other side. Uh, so think about me having a, a coin, and I flip a coin, right? And it flips up, and then I say heads or tails. Well, it lands heads. And I go again, tails, right? So one, each one of those is called a position. So heads is one position, tails is another position. In quantum computing, you can have both heads and tails all at the same time, right? That's mind-blowing. That, that, to me, is crazy. So essentially, that's basically what quantum computing is. And some people might be going, well, what's the big deal? What does this have anything to do with scripture? Well, the only place that I can find application to it biblically, and even though we hear about this all the time, constantly talking about, I mean, there are prophecy teachers that have, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence today. How about artificial intelligence? We're going to talk about, at the, look, at the end of the day, it, they're going to have constant advancements of artificial intelligence. And I'm going to be frank with you guys. I'm going to just be blunt. Who cares? Seriously, who cares? I, I did I did podcasts before, and I just, to be really honest with you folks, I wasted my time. And some people might think that I'm being a little harsh. No, at the end of the day, look, this is basically why I'm, I, I keep up on quantum computing. Is because the only place that I could see biblical application for this, and, and I might be wrong, is in Revelation chapter 13, and we can go to verse 17. Let me go over there. So if we look at chapter 13, this is, a, uh, this is the Legacy Standard Bible. I do use the New King James. This is what it says in verse 17. This is talking about the false prophet, the beast from the earth. It says, and let me go to 16. Verse 16 says, and he causes all... And this is a funny ha ha ha, as if you've never heard this before. The word all in Greek is all. Anyways, just thought I'd throw that in there. And he causes all, the small and the great. Some translations say both small and great. And the rich and the poor. And the free men and the slaves. What does that tell you? That in the end times, uh, Daniel's 70th week, there are going to be slaves that they be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. So far, I know you guys are all tracking with me. Verse 17 says, And that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, verse 18 says, Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man, and his number is 666. Do me a favor. Don't try to figure out who the Antichrist is. At the end of the day, who gives a rip? 
I don't care who he is. You shouldn't care who he is either. And you know what? For those that are going to be left behind, we don't we should be praying not that they realize who the antichrist is, but that they realize who the Christ is. That should be our prayer. So a little side note here for those that are just constantly talking about who the antichrist is and it could possibly be this guy and who cares? We need to be pointing people to the Christ, Jesus Christ, the one and only, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, not to the Antichrist. All right. Side note. So again, the only place that I can find application to where the marriage between, um, gotta love this little web here, uh, quantum computing and uh, artificial intelligence, that marriage is here. And why is that? Well, because you're going to have to track the entire population of the earth at that time in real time. Transactions in real time. So it gives a whole new meaning to what we hear uh, when it comes to tracking, right? You got data tracking and all kinds of stuff. Man, there it is again. I see it going like this, this little strand of spider web. Spider-Man was here, I guess. See, I'm talking about the multiverse and Spider-Man shows up. But anyway, so this is, this is going to have to happen in real time. And the way that it, it sits now, that can't happen. There's no way on earth. Some people say, yeah, I can. We have our phones. There's no way on earth. There's way too much data, way too many people. And yeah, even though we have data centers, like I told you before, it's one, one strand of command, then one out. And even though you can have a whole slew of data centers that are processing information, it's not, it, it's still, you still cannot get the amount of information data processed that you would need in order to make this happen. So in comes quantum computing. And China is trying to, whoever gets, whoever has the biggest breakthrough of, of quantum computing, they're going to be uh, a force to be reckoned with. Why is that? And like I read to you, China did that breakthrough supposedly. Um, it is because quantum computing is going to give whoever has that breakthrough the ability to process all of the information that's been stored on everybody you me and everybody else included all in in a matter of minutes or in a matter of hours let me see if i can kind of um bring it in for a landing i know i said a lot without saying a whole lot uh think of encryption right so encryption happens all the time when you're purchasing something for those that have bought gospel cards from the website or you've donated to a, a ministry online your payment is encrypted your payment method is encrypted supposedly it should be encrypted that encryption doesn't allow for somebody to take or steal your information well, AT&T didn't do a very good job at that, but that's basically the idea. Encryption. Think of cryptography. It's a whole field. You can go back to World War II, and we had the Enigma machines, were, which were cryptography machines. And the Enigma machine was the one you could send messages based. It would scramble messages, and whoever had the Enigma machine on the other side could unscramble that message and get it without the enemy being able to decipher the message. Germany had it. We had it. And we still have our version of encryption. There's different levels of encryption. But if, if and when, not if, when quantum computing has the big breakthrough, and like I told you, it works on qubits, superposition, both positions on and off all at the same time. It could do a million different calculations on once. It could break problems, mathematical problems we've never been able to break. It could crack them like that. So what does that mean for cryptography? What does that mean for encryption? That's a big deal because... 
uh, national security, military, this is from all over the world. Different countries have their version of encryption. But if you have a major breakthrough in quantum computing, a quantum computer can break encryption like that, like that. So what they're trying to do now is there's a new field, a fairly new field called quantum encryption or quantum cryptography. Why? Because they realize, well, if we, we got quantum computing. If we can have a massive breakthrough in quantum computing, well, then what happens to our encryption? What happens to a lot of information that sort of, yeah, we could process it, but other people could break th that encryption. And so we have that problem. But if we really kind of strip it all down, what this is telling me, this race to be the first for quantum computing on multiple levels, isn't so much that this country is going to take that country's secrets and that country is going to take this country's secrets. If, if anything, it tells me that quantum computing will be able to do what? It will be able to break down and process all of the data that's been stored for decades on everybody throughout the entire world. So personally myself, I don't believe, sorry for that big plosive. Personally myself, I don't believe that's going to happen until the, um, until after the rapture of the church, even though that's what we're seeing now is breakthroughs in quantum computing. But essentially we know from scripture that on the flip side of the rapture, there's going to be 10 kings that are going to divide, well, essentially rule the world, right? We've got 10. Uh, who they are, I don't know. I don't care. Are they going to be Silicon Valley uh, magnets? Who cares? Are they going to be politicians? Who cares? I don't care. I don't plan on being here, and I sure hope that you don't plan on being here either. That's why we're... It is our responsibility to go share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, some people might be sitting there and going, dude, they, you know, you don't care. No, I don't. I really don't. And I think we waste way too much time, effort, and energy trying to figure these things out. At the end of the day, who cares? Anything outside of scripture, anything that we think of that is outside of scripture right here is, is just speculation. And as much as some people think that speculation's okay, all right, you know, I've speculated a little bit here and there, but seriously, folks, keep it to a minimum. We know there's going to be 10 kings before Antichrist rules and reigns as the biggest despot dictator of the entire history of the world. There's going to be 10 kings, first three and a half years. We know that for sure. And I guarantee you they will use quantum computing to track everybody. Everybody. This here doesn't happen until the three and a half year mark. But I guarantee you that people will be tracked. Is there going to be a digital currency? Yes, there is going to be a digital currency. Where there be, will there be a central bank digital currency? Yes, there will be one. Why? Well, because that's one way that you could track everybody. Everyone. You'll be able to track everything they do. And some people say, well, can't they do that now? Yeah, to a, to a, to a large degree, yeah, but not they, they can't process everything all at once. When things go digital, that'll be a different story. But it's not going to be something that happens overnight. We're seeing this incremental move towards a digital currency. And let's say, let's just hypothetically say that tomorrow the U.S. goes digital. That doesn't mean that the money that you have, you won't be able to pay cash. That's not what that means. What it's saying is, and this is what I believe would happen. Let's say tomorrow we hypothetically go digital. They will give you incentives just as they did four years ago. Even Israel did. If you get a little certain pokey pokey, we'll give you free beer. You can get free booze. They're incentives. And that's the same thing that's going to happen until they can get the trust of the general public. If you go digital today, we will give you a five or $10,000 digital credit 
which, by the way, you'll have to pay taxes on. Two things are sure in life, death and taxes. So it'll be on a, it'll be on that kind of system, right? That will be your motivation. Eventually they'll start to tighten the, the, the screws. They'll start to, to, to tighten the reins. It'll go from, we will give you X if you go digital to you better go digital or else you'll lose whatever you have here, whatever money you haven't converted to digital, you'll lose it. Look, folks, at the end of the day, Lord willing, I don't plan on being here for any of that. I don't. And let's say for whatever reason we happen to be here, if everything goes to jail. Do you not think that the Lord is able to take care of his own? Didn't the Lord tell us not to worry about anything? Didn't the Lord tell us be anxious for nothing? Lord said, why do you worry? I mean, he takes care of the lilies in the field and the fowl in the air. Who then by worrying? You know that, Matthew? I believe chapter 6. I think the end of that pretty much sums it up. Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So back to quantum computing, that's really the only place I could see it in Scripture. So we could spend a whole lot of time talking about artificial intelligence. And AI has its place. It's got its benefits. But I think, unfortunately, too many people are going to rely on that. Very much like typing. You remember when everybody used to have penmanship in school? You got graded on the way that you wrote. People had gorgeous penmanship. Little by little, that started to wane with the advent of typing, with the advent of computers. Now everything is just typing, autocorrect. We don't even know how to spell anymore. So it's almost this intentional dumbing down of the masses. But so artificial intelligence, and I, not that I'm not going to keep talking about it. I might occasionally bring this up, quantum computing, just give you an update. But at the end of the day, artificial intelligence is the software and quantum computing is the, the hardware. And at some point, you're going to have a marriage of these two. And when you have that marriage, it's going to be game, set, match. Artificial intelligence is growing exponentially by leaps and bounds. And I figured it would. Just know that. I think everything I do, I use Photoshop, Illustrator. I use those programs a lot. They have generative fills now. They have generative AI. Photoshop is now using what once only a handful of programs were doing, which was um, you were able to put in a prompt and it would give you an image. And now you could do video through OpenAI. You put a prompt and it creates a video. I, I recently talked about that. I might put that up. So anyway, so listen, folks, at the end of the day, when you have something like quantum computing, which can process just exorbitant amounts of data all at the same time, that should really perk our ears up to what? To worry? No, not to worry, but to think that at the Lord is coming any moment. When we look at what's happening in Israel, we should continue to pray for Israel. But at the end of the day, what should that tell us? That the Lord is coming back for us any moment. I really don't think that it doesn't matter which way you, you slice the pie. Israel is backed up into a corner. As far as I understand, the prime minister, the new prime minister of the UK, of England, is going to put an embargo on weapons sent to Israel. So what does that tell you? They're going to have to defend themselves all on their own. I don't know what November holds. I don't even know what tomorrow holds. The Bible tells us, right? I was just kind of talking about that. Don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow has its own troubles of its own. So back to this whole notion of quantum computing and artificial intelligence. Folks, look, I'm not here to worry you guys. I'm not telling you guys this to worry you because you shouldn't. Prophecy shouldn't, shouldn't worry you. 
Nobody should be preaching and talking about Bible prophecy as a means to scare you, as a means to worry you, as a means to make you anxious. That's bunk. And if they're doing that, stop watching them. Seriously. For the believer, every time we think about end times Bible prophecy should encourage us. Because for the believer, what's coming is better than anything we've ever had. For the believer, what we see happening is pointing to the near return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How is it pointing to the near return of Jesus Christ in the rapture? Now, the rapture is signless. There are no signs. The signs that we're seeing are what's pointing to the tribulation, to Daniel's 70th week, the things that are going to happen post-rapture. It's important that we understand and that we're clear about that. There are no signs pointing to the rapture of the church. When you hear, oh, this sign and that sign, there are no signs. What we are seeing are the shadows of things to come on the flip side of the rapture during Daniel's 70th week. End of story. Or even in the gap period between post-rapture, pre-tribulation. But outside of that, what we're seeing, we're seeing these things so close. I wrote an article about this not too long ago, and I would encourage you to go read it if you haven't read it. It's almost Thanksgiving. When you see Christmas decorations going up in the store, you know that Thanksgiving is right around the corner. We're seeing all of these signs that are pointing to what's going to happen during Daniel's 70th week, not the rapture of the church. So if we're seeing these shadows, these signs that are pointing to those events which will happen post-rapture, Daniel's 70th week, how much closer are we to the catching away of the church? When we're seeing the very close, near, some are talking within the next decade, I think sooner, of quantum breakthrough, and we just saw that article that China is racing to get that, if we're seeing the technology happen and it's so near between this quantum breakthrough and artificial intelligence, that marriage together, what does that tell us? It tells us that we are close. We're very near the possibility where data will be able to be broken down in such a way that there's no hiding. None of it. So it tells me, especially in light of what I read in Revelation chapter 13, starting in verse 17, or if you want to read 16 to 18, is that te the technology to track everybody, and I mean everybody, is we're, we're almost there. The only thing I believe that could stop an all-out war in Israel I mean, some people are saying World War III, but an all-out war in Israel, I believe it's the rapture of the church. How so? Because it is going to reset everybody's attention. And neither you nor I can imagine what it's going to be like when people supernaturally disappear by the millions worldwide. It's going to be a game changer. We can't imagine what it's going to be like. We just can't. So, yeah. I just wanted to just briefly talk about this. It was, what, 45 minutes? Maybe even half an hour, because I think I spent the first 10 minutes talking about the gospel. Which is central. It is central to what we should be doing when we're talking about end times Bible prophecy, when we're talking about scripture. The gospel should be front and center. Not just a two-second, oh, by the way, if you don't know Jesus Christ, well, you got to know Jesus Christ. All right, happy, have a nice day. See ya. Really? And by the way, let me throw this in there. Um, I know that I've mentioned prepping. Ron and I talked about that, and there's nowhere in the Bible. I know people try to go, a prudent man sees danger and does something about it. Something along those lines. Seriously? You really think that that's in reference to prepping? That we have to hunker down because we're going to go through hell on earth? Come on, people, seriously. 
Those are Americans, Western people speaking. Do you really think that people in Cambodia or North Korea or our brothers and sisters in Iran, those that are getting persecuted or the underground church in China is going, we must prep for what's coming. What's coming? They're already experiencing crazy persecution and they have been. Here we are in the West. We're, oh, everybody hunker down and prep and prep and prep. I'm sorry. I'm going to stick to my... My guns, meaning I'm going to stick to what the word of God says. I don't see prepping anywhere. If anything, I see quite the opposite. Get out there and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, seriously, here in the West, we can get things so mixed up. We talked about, oh, persecution is coming to the West. As if we're some like special or something that we've got to get purified or something. Because, you know, the rest of the world, well, they've been being, they've been, they have been persecuted and then, and they're continually being persecuted. And well, we in the West here, well, we got to wait till uh, we got to wait till we're persecuted before we go up in the rapture of the church as a means to purify us. So something still, still precious. Really? I'm sorry. I just get really, really bothered because it's super insensitive. I think at times to think of us, Americans as we're somehow better than our brothers and sisters that are suffering like crazy in other parts of the world. I would encourage you to get and sign up and go to Voice of the Martyrs, which was started by Richard Wormbrand. I would encourage you to read his story. I would encourage you to get the magazine and read it. It will really put things in perspective as to what other people are going through and currently experiencing. Even in Israel, Christians experiencing persecution by the Jews, the Orthodox Jews that want to kill them for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and proclaiming Jesus as Yeshua, Amashiach. Come on, folks. Seriously. And look, you're not going to hear this probably from most Bible prophecy shows. You just won't. Why? Well, maybe they're just too scared to lose subscribers. Doesn't look good. I don't care. I honestly don't care. I really don't. I think we should, we should be so far beyond that. But when you hear people saying prep, 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 persecution, persecution, west, 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 really? That's so insensitive, man. I really, it just blows my mind. What I will tell you this is that we were given a big responsibility by the Lord. We were given freedom as most other countries in the world weren't given as a means to proclaim the gospel, and we're blowing it. I know I got off on a tangent, but it just ticks me off when I hear that. I got to say, it ticks me off. And look, folks, at the end of the day, some people might not like what I have to say. That's okay. Because at the end of the day, I'm not here to impress people. I want to share the gospel. I want to be able to share what the Holy Spirit lays on my heart. But we really, really need to think in biblical perspective. Do we really think that if Paul, the Apostle Paul, had a YouTube channel with the way that he talked in Scripture, the way that he was so bold, the disciples, do you really think that they would have millions of subscribers? Let's be honest about this. Seriously. If we want to think about this in terms of present day? Do you really think that Peter, who was crucified upside down, most of them were martyred. The only one that wasn't was John. They tried supposedly boiling him in oil. That didn't work, so they exiled him to Patmos. Do you really think that they would be popular? I think they would have got canceled on YouTube like that. And if we think about the mentality currently of the American church, do you really, really think that people would have wanted to hear what Paul had to say? I don't think so. So I think it's important that we really put perspective and we really put priority on things. Folks, why do we relegate persecution only to physical persecution? Why do we do that? Why do we think of it as only physical? So many people are experiencing so many different things. But we only relegate it to physical persecution when it, can, when it encompasses so much more. 
Jesus Christ is not an American. I hate to break it to you. He's not a Methodist. He's not a Presbyterian. Okay, he's not an evangelical. He's not even a Christian. Whoa, he's not. When Jesus Christ was here, he was Jewish. I mean, I know that might be news to some people, but he was Jewish. He was not a Christian. All right? Now, I could spend a whole lot of time talking about these things. But oftentimes, we in the West, we think in that perspective. And I, 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 know, I, totally, I know I totally got away from quantum computing. And I, I never expected this to be a detailed explanation of quantum computing. But where I really was getting at is that if we see these things, we see artificial intelligence, which is only going to keep growing by leaps and bounds. And we see quantum computing. It's only going to keep growing by leaps and bounds. But folks, let me tell you something. Don't get discouraged. Why? Because prophecy has an expiration date. Prophecy has a shelf life. You see this? I've got a shelf right here. But prophecy has a shelf life. It will expire. It's not going to go on forever and ever. And what we're seeing is we're getting near that expiration date. So what could you expect? Well, you could expect the Lord Jesus Christ to come back for his church soon. There are some of those that say you shouldn't say that because you get people's hopes up. Well, duh. What do you think Bible prophecy is supposed to do for the believer? It's supposed to do one of two things or both. It should get us super excited because that means we're going to meet our maker soon. And then number two, it should, it should really propel us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll even throw a third one in there. If we know that our Lord and Savior is coming back for us at any moment, shouldn't that, shouldn't that get you and me to live lives that are holy? Because we don't know when our Lord is coming. We know by the season we're living in that we're in the we are in the season of his return, not the rapture, his second coming. We're in that season. How much closer are we to the rapture of the church? That should propel you and me to holy living. Three things. So family, look. When you hear the word quantum computing, when you hear other people talk about, whoa, artificial intelligence and transhumanism, and that's a big deal, right? But do you really think that the Lord is going to allow people to live forever and ever to break the human genome? I don't think so. Why? Because God created us. We're his creation. He's the great I am. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the one that created something out of nothing. He spoke it to existence. It's something we can't wrap our minds around because we are finite beings and he's infinite. He's the great I am. Didn't have a beginning, doesn't have an end. He's always been. Right? So don't let people discourage you when you hear about all these uh, crazy breakthroughs in artificial intelligence. And as cool as some of the stuff is, because it's really cool. I mean, seriously. I could put a prompt and go, a train flying through outer space, and it just makes you a video. I mean, seriously, that is impressive that we've come to that point. But Satan is going to take that technology, quantum computing and artificial intelligence, and he's going to use it for this. Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 to 18. Right there. Because the one that holds the key to life is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he's not going to give that to anybody. The Lord doesn't share his glory with anybody. Praise God for that. So please, don't be alarmed. These things are happening. They're going to continue to happen. But at the end of the day, look to Jesus Christ, the author, perfecter, finisher of our faith. Right? If you're in Christ, be happy, be joyful, because our Lord and Savior is coming back any moment. When you hear people quote Luke 21, 28, they quote it out of context. I made that mistake myself. I apologize, but they're quoting it out of context. When you see these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. That is not for us. That is not to our generation. He's not talking about the rapture of the church. The, our Lord and Savior is talking about the people that are going to be living during the tribulation period. 
That is what that verse is in context about. But when we use it, when you hear people use it, think about the fact that at any moment the Lord could come back for us. You hear the last trumpet, we're gathered with him in the Shekinah glory, not the cumulonimbus clouds, the Shekinah glory, his presence, and to be with him forevermore. How is that not encouraging? I don't know. But to me, man, I'm excited. And I hope that you're excited too. I know I went a little longer. I know I rabbit trailed. But that's, that's the whole point of these unscripted. They are not scripted. I just felt in my heart. I, I saw this article. Ron shared it with me. It kind of really brought me back to all the stuff I'd been reading about quantum computing. And the only verse that I can come back to is that one right there in Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 to 17. Read it for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Do your research. If you understand quantum computing, hey, fantastic. Uh, you try and help me understand it better. But folks, listen, Jesus Christ is coming back. He is coming back. When? I don't know. Soon. Because things can't keep going over and over and over again. So that's it. At the end of the day, I'm up. I'm over. I'm done with time. I have just a few minutes left. And before we go, I just want to tell everybody, listen, if you haven't called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, I implore you, call on his name today. Don't put it off. The Bible says that tomorrow's promise to no man. You don't know what's going to happen. And neither do I. So if you haven't called on the name of the Lord, call on his name right now. He's faithful. He will meet you where you're at. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, get out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Share the good news. And he's coming back soon. Okay, family, let me go ahead and close this out in prayer because I could keep talking forever and ever and ever. I love you guys. I enjoy these unscripted. And hopefully I'll do more. And I know I just went all over the map and rabbit trail. So please forgive me, but family, I love you guys. And I can't thank you guys for your support, especially prayer. All right. Father God, we come before you and we thank you so much because we know that you're coming. I pray that that would propel us to live holy lives, that we would be salt and light to those around us, that we would get out and share the gospel with whoever we come in contact with. Father God, now is the time to be sprinting towards the finish. Now is not the time to hunker down. Now is not the time to be shying away from your work. Now, more than ever, is the time for us to engage in the battle, Father God, because at any moment you're coming back. And Lord, I pray that we would be faithful stewards of the talents you've entrusted us with to invest those. And Father God, give you a return for the talents that you've given us. We thank you that you are faithful. And that at any moment we'll hear that trumpet sound and we will be with you forever and ever. And they can have this world. They could keep it. And thank you that, Lord, you will remake it the way that you intended it to be. I pray you would bless everybody that's listening. I pray you would bless and watch over everybody that's hearing. If they don't know you, Father God, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would, that you would convict them of their deep-seated need for you. Love you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Family, I hope you guys were blessed, encouraged, challenged. Until the next time, until the next Unscripted, until the next Rabbit Trail, may the Lord richly bless you guys. Have a nice day.